Today, GPS devices that can determine where you are in the world have become ubiquitous. In fact, there's a very good chance that the device you are using to listen to this podcast has a GPS receiver in it. GPS is used for a wide variety of applications all over the world. It's been called the world's first global utility. Learn more about the global positioning system, how it came to be, and how it works on this episode of Everything Everywhere Daily. This episode is sponsored by Audible.com. The audiobook I would recommend, which deals with today's subject, is You Are Here, From the Compass to GPS, The History and Future of How We Find Ourselves, by Hiawatha Bray. The book covers the history of navigation from beacons, compasses, and maps, and how satellite navigation affects every aspect of our society. You can get a free one-month trial to Audible and two free audiobooks by going to audibletrial.com slash everything everywhere or by clicking on the link in the show notes. The history of satellite navigation dates back to the very first satellite, Sputnik 1. The Sputnik satellite wasn't in orbit very long, but while it was there, it had a radio beacon that you could hear from Earth. Two American scientists, William Geyer and George Weifenbach of the John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, quickly figured out that they could determine the position of Sputnik by measuring the Doppler shift of the radio signal it was sending out. Soon, scientists were wondering if they could do the opposite, determine a person's location on Earth based on a signal received from a satellite. In 1960, they tested the first satellite navigation system called Transit, or NAVSAT. The initial goal was to provide location information to Polaris nuclear submarines who needed location data to fire their missiles. Transit consisted of five satellites that could provide accuracy up to 200 meters or 660 feet, which is close enough for lobbing nuclear weapons. While 200 meters was better than nothing, it wasn't great. And more importantly, it took quite a bit of time to get a reading. It wasn't something you could just instantly get like you can on today's GPS devices. A big step took place in 1967, 1969, and 1974 with the launch of the Timation satellites. These satellites were the first satellites put into orbit which had highly accurate clocks, and with the 1974 launch having the first atomic clock on a satellite. They could broadcast an accurate time signal globally, which is important for navigation. If you remember back to my timekeeping episode, it was the problem of longitude and navigation which was the impetus for developing accurate clocks which could be taken out to sea. This also served as a proof of concept for the placement of accurate clocks on satellites, which would become the center of the GPS program. There were many different electronic navigation systems in place by the early 1970s. The transit satellites were still functioning, and there were also ground-based systems as well. All of them had their pluses and minuses, but none of the systems were really the solution that they were looking for. In 1973, a team in the Pentagon laid down a framework for a system that synthesized all of the various programs which currently existed and created a new system called NAVSTAR. The first NAVSTAR satellite was launched in 1978. The system was intended to be for the exclusive use of the military. However, in 1983, Korean Airlines Flight 007 was shot down over Soviet airspace. It was something that could have been avoided if the aircraft had accurate navigation information. After the aircraft was down, President Reagan ordered that the GPS be open for free civilian use. However, they adopted a policy of what was called selective availability. That meant that some higher accuracy frequencies were only available to the military, and other less accurate frequencies were available to the public. The next big advance in GPS occurred on May 1st, 2000, when President Clinton ordered the end of selective availability. Civilians would get the same level of accuracy as the military. At this point, differential GPS systems were being used by civilians, which greatly improved accuracy, so there wasn't really a point in locking military channels. Also, the military had figured out how to deny civilian signals on a regional basis, so it could be denied to adversaries should the need arise. One of the biggest changes in how we use GPS was the creation of more powerful electronics. In 1983, when GPS was open to the public, user terminals were very expensive. The first handheld GPS device was the Magellan NAV-1000, which came out in 1989 and cost $3,000. Inflation adjusted, that would be $6,200 today. 
As electronics became cheaper, GPS found itself in more and more products, as the cost of GPS chipsets had also gotten extremely cheap, and the quality had dramatically improved. So, how does GPS work exactly? It's roughly based on triangulation. Imagine two circles like on a Venn diagram. They would overlap at two points. If you knew your distance from two different places, you couldn't say exactly where you were because there are two spots with that same distance. You need a third circle to figure out which of the two spots is the one you're at. GPS works in a similar way, except instead of circles, you're dealing with spheres because it's in three dimensions. You also, therefore, need a fourth satellite to get an accurate position. That is why you always need to be able to see four satellites for GPS to work. In theory, if you're in an open area, you should always be able to see at least six satellites. The GPS system has three different components, ground stations, satellites, and user devices. Most of you are pretty familiar with user devices, so that doesn't require much explanation. The current GPS satellites consist of a constellation of 24 different satellites, consisting of six satellites in each of four different orbital levels. There are currently 31 satellites in orbit, including the backups. The satellites are in medium Earth orbit with an average altitude of about 20,000 kilometers. Each GPS satellite is also, by law, configured to detect nuclear explosions. They have X-ray and gamma ray detectors that can detect blasts and determine their location. The key to the GPS system is time. Each GPS satellite has several atomic clocks on board. Many people think that GPS works by determining the direction of radio waves from a satellite or from the strength of the signal. Neither are true. What it does is take the time from the various satellites to determine the distance to the satellites by calculating it from the speed of light. In addition to the time data sent by the satellites, it also sends a table of data for the satellites called the Almanac and the Ephemeris. The Almanac has approximate orbital information for all the satellites in the constellation, and the Ephemeris has more accurate information, which is updated more frequently. The Almanac is exactly 15 kilobits in size and takes a satellite 12.5 minutes to completely send it. If you ever used an older GPS device, it would often take 10 or 15 minutes to get a lock the first time you used it because it had to download the full almanac. The bit rate for sending it is extremely slow because the satellites are so far away and the signal is so weak. The ephemeris is only 1500 bits and is updated every few hours. If you're using a device that's connected to the internet, you don't have to wait so long to get a lock because you can download the almanac and the ephemeris over the internet, which is much faster. The clocks on the satellite are also adjusted to compensate for relativity. As Einstein noted, time on a satellite will go slightly faster than on Earth because of its high speed and distance from the center of Earth's gravity. They have to run the clocks 7 microseconds slower per day to compensate for this, to make the clocks on the satellite seem that they're running at the same time as the surface. Without relativity compensation, the whole GPS system would fall apart quickly. The third leg of the GPS system are the ground stations, which most people never see or hear about. The entire GPS system is run by the U.S. Space Force out of Building 400 of the Shriver Air Force Base in Colorado Springs, Colorado. This is known as the Master Control Station. There they have staff that monitor the health of the satellites 24 hours a day. There are also other monitoring stations located around the world. Monitoring stations are located in Ascension Island, Diego Garcia, Kwajalein, Hawaii, Argentina, the United Kingdom, Tahiti, Bahrain, Ecuador, Washington, D.C., Alaska, South Korea, South Africa, and New Zealand. Every satellite should be able to see at least three ground stations at any given time. One of the most important functions of the ground stations is to make sure that the clocks on the satellites are accurate. While the atomic clocks on the satellites are very accurate, they're nothing compared to the cesium atomic clocks which are on the ground. Updates to the ephemera and the clock corrections are sent to the satellites at least once per day. If you're in North America, there is a further signal you might be able to use called the Wide Area Augmentation Signal, or the WAAS. This is a ground-based system that improves accuracy by closely monitoring GPS signals, then sending out even more accurate ephemeris data every few minutes rather than every few hours. This includes information on ionosphere delay, which is what changes in the ionosphere can cause tiny delays to the radio satellite signal. 
Smartphones can also get augmented signals from cell towers to quickly give a device a ballpark estimate of where its location is. Everything I just mentioned is great, but there was one big problem for a lot of people. Everything is run by the United States military. If you're a foreign country, what would happen if the U.S. decided to shut down the GPS system or degrade the signal? Or what if it just happened to break? If you were dependent upon GPS, it would lead to a lot of problems. That has led several countries to develop their own satellite navigation systems. The only real competitor to GPS would be the Russian GLONASS system. Like the American system, it was developed during the Cold War. The system went offline in the late 1990s due to budget issues, but the full satellite constellation was back by 2011. Like the GPS system, it has 24 satellites and it is open to the public. Many user devices built today can now use both GPS and GLONASS satellites and often use them in unison with each other. Today, the GLONASS system takes up over a third of the Russian space program budget. In 2016, the European Union satellite navigation system became live. Known as Galileo, it too can be used by many devices in conjunction with GPS and GLONASS. The system has had its share of problems, including cost overruns, political issues, and even outages of the system. The Chinese system, known as Baidu, was just upgraded and has recently become a global system a few months ago. There aren't many devices that can access it yet, but in theory, it should be better than the other current systems just because it was more recently designed. Japan and India also have their own systems, but they're not global. They all only work in their own countries and in the area immediately surrounding it. So, what's the future for the GPS system? The current generation of GPS satellites is known as GPS-2. GPS-3 satellites are currently being launched, and the GPS-3 system should be operational by 2023. GPS-3 should be a major upgrade to the GPS system. For starters, it should be significantly more accurate. Currently, a GPS device can tell you what road you're on. With GPS-3, it should be able to tell you what lane you're in. Specifically, today you have a 5 to 10 meter level of accuracy, and with GPS-3, it should be down to 1 to 3 meters. It'll also be harder to jam the signal with GPS-3, and it will work better with the navigational systems from other countries. It'll use the same signal as the systems from China, the EU, and Japan. The satellites will also have a longer lifespan, and will be smaller, meaning that you can launch two of them at a time rather than just one. Overall costs for operating the system should go down. So, the next time you type in directions and track your way to your next destination, have a deeper appreciation for everything which goes into the only global, free utility in the world. Executive producer of Everything Everywhere Daily is James Makala. Special thanks to everyone who supports the show over on Patreon. Please remember to leave a review over on Apple Podcasts. Even a simple review can really help the show get discovered in the sea of other podcasts that are out there.